Hi everybody and welcome to church again. Welcome to our live stream and welcome. Thank you for joining with us together again as we are coming together to praise God, to glorify his name and to re meet together as the body of Christ and as the family of Jesus. It's so great to have you with us and we are going to, um, I'm sure, um, grow as a result of us being together today. Today is going to be a little bit different. Um, today, of course, we are calling our Vision Sunday. Um, straight after the service on Zoom is our AGM, where we'll be presenting accounts and uh, uh, some highlighting some of the goals that we think we're going to be pursuing over the next year and a uh, couple of years. Um, and uh, really hope that you can be a part of that and join with us in that. Um, we, uh, we, we sent the links to you, we sent all of the documents to you if you're on the mailing list, so we hope you got those. Um, but regardless, feel free to join with us. It's open to everybody. We do have an official membership list um, where you can take official membership of the church, and we will be talking about that in the new year at some point. Um, and giving people an opportunity of becoming members of the church, official members of the church again. But our attitude is that we're all members of the church. We're all family uh, in the church. And so you are very welcome to be part of our AGM together. And we do hope that you join us for what shouldn't be a very long time, but should be a good time. Um, today in our service, we are going to be presenting um, some sort of vision dimension things. We're not necessarily talking about goals, but describing the kind of church that we want to be in. And there's a presentation coming up very, very soon about that, as well as, of course, as finishing off our ministry, or actually I say that, I may actually uh, be picking up some points next week, but finishing off a look at or what the Bible says about each other and one another and how we are to relate to one another. Uh, do have a couple of extra thoughts just to, uh, to perhaps share next week um, to finish that off. Um, but today's the last week that we're going to look at what the New Testament says um, using the terms one another and each other. Um, that probably wasn't very clear, but never mind. Let's worship together. Let's lift up his name. Let's glorify him as Steve comes and leads us in another song.
Wonderful. Thanks, Steve. Um, great to have a time of worship together. My apologies that the words seem to be a little bit skewed and off the screen. I'm not quite sure how that happened, and hopefully it won't um, have happened in any of the other songs. But I trust you were able to sing along and to worship along anyway. And, uh, of course, you know, the important thing about worship is the hearts that we're offering to God anyway. We're going to come now to the vision presentation that I talked about. Um, it's a, a pre-recorded video that I've done because I've got some accompanying, accompanying um, slides to go with that. And I just want to talk a little bit today about the kind of church that we want to be and that we've been seeking to be since um, actually certainly since the time that we've been I've been here and I believe even before that as well so uh, trust you enjoyed this uh, presentation and that it does inspire you as well
Hi everybody and welcome to our Vision Sunday. It's great to uh, be able to talk vision and direction and the future with you. And of course, later on, we are looking forward to having our AGM where we'll be presenting our accounts and also presenting some of the thoughts in terms of goals of where we think the next year is going to be taking us. And of course, you've been sent those by email. And so I trust that you are completely prepared. But right now I want to talk about what kind of a church we want to be. Now, what is a vision? Well, a vision has often been described as a picture of a preferred future. And I'm sure that that can involve things that have been done, but I think it's also uh, about the kind of church that we have become or that we are continuing, I trust, to become. And what kind of a church is that? Well, let's have a look. You might recognize this logo. We adopted this logo just after I came and we adopted the tagline that you see at the bottom, heart for God, for each other, for the community, for the world. And that began to serve us not just as a tagline, but also as a kind of a vision statement. And we talked about that um, quite a lot when that happened. And then a little bit later, um, at the end of a, of a bit of a journey, we finally came up with four values that we want to promote as a church. Let me show you a little diagram here. You can see that there are four areas, four values that we, um, that we want to follow. And can you also see that blue line that's just encircling everything, which is the work and of the Holy Spirit? Because we're a Pentecostal church and we believe that the Holy Spirit is integral in everything that we do. And uh, our new values um, didn't actually then speak specifically about the Holy Spirit because we wanted the Holy Spirit to surround everything that we were talking about. Now, if you're observant, you may have noticed that these um, uh, words or words like them are on pictures in our foyer, but you will also perhaps have noticed that some of those words have changed. Now, I want to stress, it's not our aims, it's not our desires, it's not what we want to accomplish, what we want to see that is in any way changed. If anything, these changes of words are helping us to define more closely exactly what we've wanted to happen all the time. So let me have a look at how we've re-emphasized some of these things. The first thing is we changed the word worship to devotion. Uh, and, uh, and that was absolutely key. You see, devotion includes worship and it includes prayer. And it includes study of God's word um, as part of it. Those things flow out of devotion. Those things are an expression of devotion. In fact, maybe worship is in itself um, a form of, of, of devotion. But we wanted to use the word devotion, or I wanted to use the word devotion because uh, it speaks of, for, to me of so much more. You see, it's not just about what we do to honor God. It's about how we see ourselves in God's presence. You see, to be devoted expresses the idea that we are set apart, that we belong to God. And out of that flows the rest. You see, we are devoted. We are set apart. We've been called out to follow Jesus and to belong to him specifically. This is what devotion is talking about. Then there's also family that stayed the same. And then we have serving instead of what you'll see on the pictures, which is service. And uh, serving, I suppose, if you're, you, as I look at it, it sounds a little bit grammatically odd. Um, we maybe could have stayed with service or tried servanthood. But the problem is that the word servanthood doesn't seem to be particularly um, accessible. Not many people would understand what that's all about. And also uh, the idea of service, well, that carries a little bit of a catering industry vibe for me. Whereas serving is all about us actually doing the thing. 
It's about us getting out there and making a difference in people's lives. It's about us caring for people and loving people and helping people and giving of ourselves to people. And for me, that was absolutely key because it's what we seek to do in a whole range of opportunities. And then finally, what we had as mission became witness. And again, that's because the word mission um, uh, is a little bit, uh, I guess, uh, not accessible uh, to people. And evangelism, which could be an alternative, is also a little bit um, of uh, an inaccessible word. But also, um, it was very interesting. Just a few years ago, we passed out some development plans um, to each of our departments, each of our ministries, and asked them to comment on these four values that we were beginning to, uh, to use. And a number of them came back and interpreted mission very much in terms of our support to uh, other missions. Say, uh, we have Hope Uganda and we have Living Hope Ministries and, and, and different, different groups like that. And, um, and, and it didn't carry with the, whole, with the whole idea of our own personal outreach, our own personal evangelism. Now, that was our fault, really, because, if you, again, if you look at the picture that's in the foyer, it's very much a, a picture of foreign mission. And we remain as committed to uh, Hope Uganda and Living Hope and UCB and the other missions that we support uh, as committed as we ever did. In fact, we are increasing and developing our mission support commitment. Um, but that's not the core of what this value is really talking about. Evangelism, as I said, might have worked, um, but it carries the idea of that's what we do as a church. Whereas for me, the idea of witnessing, the idea of witness breaks it right down to reflect the fact that that's what each of us are called to do. And so we will be changing those words and those pictures in the foyer in order to reflect that. Now, I want you to notice how these vision and this value, values, our vision statement, our tagline, and these values all work together. Heart for God is very much about devotion. Heart, heart for each other is about family and also about serving. Um, heart for the community is about serving and also about our witness to our local community. And of course, um, the heart for the world is about our witness. But the question is, where does all of this come from? And the simple answer is it comes from Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47, where the very first church, the church in Jerusalem, is described and it's a picture of a New Testament church. It needs to be said that churches back in the New Testament day were as diverse as they are today. But there is something within this, this passage, I believe, where we see something of the heart of God. Let's read it together just for a moment. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to everyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. As we're going to see, within this passage is an expression of each of our tagline statements and an expression of each of our value statements. But it needs to be said that the Acts 2 church was an incredible place. It was a place where people were so caught up and full of the power of the Holy Spirit. They were so caught up with a desire to reach their world and to reach the people around them. So desiring to glorify God that they literally changed the environment that they found themselves in. Surely that's the kind of church we want to be. And that's why we're looking seriously at learning what it means to be a church like the Acts 2 church or, or maybe we might say our own flavor 
of that. Let's take a look at how, as I say, our value statements and our tagline are reflected in this passage. First of all, devotion. And you can see that that circles, that heart for God thing. They devoted themselves, it says, to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, praising God. Let's keep, let, let's, let's keep uh, thinking about that. As I said, it, it's much more than any of these areas, okay? Uh, it's a complete, devotion is a complete surrendering of ourselves to God. To be devoted is to accept God's ownership of our lives, to know that our whole lives are actually about him and our reason for being, and we live our lives accordingly. I am not my own. I'm bought with a price. I belong to Jesus. I belong to him. I'm his treasured possession. But in response, I want to be devoted to him. Then there's family. They devoted themselves to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to everyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with sincere hearts, praising God. And you'll see that that circles that each other um, phrase. And uh, it incorporates what it means by family. I want you to notice how they wanted to be together. Noticed how they sacrificed and inconvenienced themselves for one another. They were a true family. And we're finishing today, or we may well be finishing today, our each other um, series where we're discovering how God calls us to each other. I do want to say, though, don't, don't be fooled into thinking that this was some sort of a communal existence. They were very much together. They were very much, they had everything in common. They did sell their position, possessions and give to one another as they needed to, but that didn't mean that there was any obligation to do that. They each had their own homes, they each had their own properties, but what we see there is an incredible generosity. An incredible generosity, but not just a generosity, it needs to be said towards each other, but also to anyone let's take a look at the next slide as we talk about serving it says they sold property and possessions to give to everyone who had need they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts enjoying the favor of all the people now sometimes of course favor is a divine gift God just grants us favor in different uh, contexts and in different places and with different people. But I suspect that these people had favor of all of the people because they earned it, because they did, did it, they gained it by their sacrificial serving and the way that they demonstrated their love in good deeds. So they earned the respect and the favor of the people that surrounded them. And finally, of course, there is witness. It's not, fine, it's not least, it just happens to come last. And it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And you'll see that it circles that for the world. Each of these things has circled some of those tagline uh, aspects. How did this happen? How did they come to the place where every single day people got saved. Every single day, people became Christians. Every single day, people gave their lives to God and started to follow him. Well, first of all, I think it was because they were a healthy church, and healthy churches will grow in every way, spiritually, relationally, and numerically. But part of that health, I believe, was the way that they shared the gospel. It was because they reached out they reached out with the message of Jesus. They spoke about what they knew and people um, came to Jesus as a result of it. He added daily those who were being saved because the church was witnessing and sharing and evangelizing, if you like, on a daily basis. So can All Sage a Community Church be 
that kind of church. I believe that it really can. We can pursue a dream of being a church that lives in devotion, lives in family, lives in serving, and lives in witness. We can be a church where all ages come together and where everyone grows to embody these principles in their lives. But you know, it's not enough to dream. Dreaming is not enough. We need to choose for this to happen. Now I'm pinching a quote from uh, Audacious Church and this is very much their, their focus with their church at the moment. They're talking uh, through uh, a whole thing about owning it. Um, but this is what one of the pastors said when he preached recently, your place in God's house is a given, but your ownership of God's house is a decision. And I love this quote because we really need to own this vision of who we are and who we want to be. See, God wants his church to impact the world. He wants it to bring change. He wants it to glorify him. And this is the most important thing that we can give our lives to. But you know, it's not enough for us as a church to say, well, we're doing these things. You know, we're going to be... Um, in devotion and family and serving and, and witness in our programs and in our activities we, and in our services. We are, of course, we're going to be doing that, but we need to be doing it as individuals in our daily lives as well. In fact, we can't say that the church is doing that if each of us as individuals are not doing it in our daily lives because we are the church. Church doesn't stop and finish when the meeting ends. We carry it on into our world and into the contexts that we find ourselves in. We need to come to a place where we say, yes, this is going to be what my life is going to be about. I'm going to live my life in devotion, in, 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 in exercising family, in, in serving those around me, and in sharing the news of Jesus in witness. It's a journey. Let's continue the journey. Let's learn how to be this kind of church. You know, we won't get it right straight away. In fact, I suspect that we, in truth, don't even really begin to recognize the full implications of what being this kind of church really means. And so to sign up for this isn't so much signing up for some kind of duty or some kind of task, but it's signing up to a learning process. It's signing up to learn what it means to be this kind of fellowship and to be this kind of person. So the kind of church we wanna be, well, we wanna be a church that's growing spiritually. We wanna be a church that's growing numerically and growing relationally. We wanna be a church that's passionate for our world and for those in need. We want to be a church where all ages are living, loving, and serving together. So let's sign up for this, because it needs all of us to accomplish it with God's help. Fantastic. I hope you were kind of inspired by that and encouraged by that. That's the kind of church that we want to be. Uh, a church that has a heart for God, a heart for each other, a heart for our community and a heart for the world. I think it would be great now just to spend a little bit of time praying um, into that while we're together uh, here on the live stream. And um, there's a number of ways that we can participate in that. I'm going to pray um, myself right now, but just want to then just take a few moments. And uh, if there are more of you at home watching this, together then actually you could gather together and just pray together for just a moment um, uh, if you're on your own then please pray as well um, of course you can put prayers on the comments as well um, that will then be can be then seen by everybody else and uh, they can uh, they can then say their amens to that as well so let's just pray uh, uh, about this, uh, this whole thing that we've just talked about, that we've just heard about, and ask God for his grace and his help 
for us to become the kind of church that he wants us to be, the kind of church that he's put on our hearts to, to become. Let's pray together. Father, we just want to thank you today that we can serve you. We want to thank you today that we are your church and that your church is an important thing. Lord, both uh, globally and locally, Father God. And we want to be a church, Father God, that uh, brings joy and pleasure to your heart, that, uh, that follows your commands to us, that becomes the kind of church that we want to be. And we pray, Father God, for your help. We pray, Father God, for your strength, Father God, and your grace. Lord, for us to grow together, to become this kind of a church. I thank you, Lord God, for the inroads we've made already, uh, Father God, but there is always so much more that can be done. And we just pray, Father God, that you would teach us by your spirit, Lord, how to be a church that love one another, love our world, and serve with all of our heart. Help us to learn how to be a church that is devoted, Lord God, to you, a church that is family to one another, a church, Lord, that serves um, our community and our world and each other with a passion. And Father, reaches out to our local community and to our, our world in witness, Lord, so that people may come to know you. Father God, thank you that that's a job that we can do as a whole church together. And it's a job that you call individuals, us to as individuals as well. And we, Lord, pray for your Holy Spirit to be poured out. Lord God, that we might be able to fulfil this commission that you've given us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just where you are, just continue to pray. Just continue to um, put your prayers on the comments and pray with one another. And just ask God to help us to, uh, to do this. Father, we worship you. your spirit Lord. Glorify your name. Your will be done. Lord help us with all that we can and do. In Jesus name. Praise your name. Amen. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. We, we bless you. Let's just worship together um, uh, before we come to God's word. the cross with every breath, the perfect life, the perfect death. You chose the cross, a crown of thorns you wore for us, and crowned us with eternal Lost in praise 
because of my disgrace you chose the cross up from the grave victorious you rose again so glorious you chose the cross the sorrow Steve, uh, Mum Mary sent a uh, a prayer to uh, via text, um, which is well worth reading out. Can I pray for my dear family? Lift us up, Lord, and make us strong and steadfast. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Great prayer there. Let's come to God's word. Next of all, when COVID nineteen first hit us and particularly during the first lockdown, I think. I think you used to hear a phrase quite a lot, including over supermarket tannoys, we're in this together. Do you remember hearing those kind of phrases? And perhaps you still do over, uh, you know, still in supermarkets and other places. Um, I think there really was an attitude of we're in this together, a real sense of coming together. People wanted, I think, to feel that they had something to give, something to help. I think that they were um, sure and certain that they wanted to be positive in what they did and they said uh, they were ready to do what was asked of them in order to make a difference. But I think what um, I often hear now is that that sense of being in it together is not necessarily as strong as it was at the beginning. Without a doubt there is still a large amount of it still there as people still are pulling together and still seeking to be encouraging and still seeking to help themselves and others 
through this time, but there is a sense in which it, it, it didn't, uh, it doesn't, or at least it didn't feel quite the same. Perhaps people, rightly or wrongly, were disillusioned by authorities. Perhaps they were disappointed that it seemed to be all going on longer than they thought it was going to be, and that maybe even offended or fearful about the fact that after making so much effort to try and make things better, we had to go through all of these restrictions again. And sadly, I think across social media, um, there has been anger and there has been frustration that's been expressed in ways that we might actually say is less than helpful. And I think it's really important that we are careful to continue to show respect, to show honour towards others, however frustrated we might feel. I think we need to try and rekindle some of that we're in it together spirit. And I think that's especially true for those of us who would want to call ourselves Christians, who would follow, want, to, want to call ourselves the followers of Jesus, because it is a part of our identity, and especially with our brothers and sisters, that we are in it together. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3 says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. 1 Corinthians 3 17 says, God's temple is sacred. And you together are that temple. You together are that temple. So we're coming to what was intended to be the final week of our Each Other series. And I've referred to it as being so again on that video that we watched presenting the vision. But as I said in a very mumbled up way at the beginning, we do have some thoughts that I may want to give to it again next week. If, if you understood my uh, my explanations earlier, you did very, very well, but then, you know, if everyone is now mystified and confused, then perhaps my work here is done. <laughs> but we're coming to the third of our weeks on this Each Other series. First week we talked about love one another. Week two was about how we should greet and accept and honour one another. We talked about not passing judgment, not grumbling, but agreeing together, bearing with one another. We talked about compassion and kindness and speaking the truth and acting justly and being prepared to submit and give way to one another. Last week, of course, was about discipling one another and growing together in our faith and in our lives. And it involved teaching one another and spurring one another on and encouraging and warning and helping and building each other up and not slandering but watching our words and again speaking truth so that yes we could all grow together. And today I want to continue with this idea by talking about serving each other. It's very interesting that as I prepared this message, I came across just one Bible verse that specifically told us to serve each other. I was quite surprised that there was only one. It's Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 that says, Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. I want you to notice particularly the descriptions of how we are to serve there, that we are to serve humbly and we are to serve in a spirit of love. You would have perhaps, like me though, expected to have seen some other verses that spelled this out clearly about serving each other. But let's not forget, please, that the context of the New Testament gives us a very clear picture that our lives are to be lives of service. And serving, of course, is important to us as one of our core values, something we talked about in that presentation earlier on and something that we're going to continue to talk about as we go through um, the coming year and beyond. The word serve occurs 52 times in the New Testament. The references tell us that first of all Jesus served. It tells us that we are to serve God. It tells us that we are to serve others and it's important of course that we remember that an absolutely key way to serve God is by serving other 
people. And we see that in Matthew chapter 25. It's the judgment seat of Christ as Jesus describes it in a kind of a parabolic form. And uh, the, Jesus is on his throne and he turns to a group of people and he says to them that they have uh, served him well, that they have, uh, they have fed him when he's hungry and they've given him a drink when he's thirsty and they've visited him when he's sick or in prison. And it says that they turned to him and they said, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? or a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you, or sick or in prison and go and visit you. And then Jesus replies, it says, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters you of mine, you did for me. I think it's always worth a challenge, isn't it, to our hearts and to our lives, to ask ourselves the question, how have we served the hungry stranger? just recently? How have we served those who are cold or those who are sick, are sick just recently? But Jesus says that by serving others, we serve him. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So are we using what we're good at for other people's benefit? We can also talk about serving in the context of us being a body. Romans chapter 12 verse 5 says, So in Christ we though are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 25 says, So that there will be no division in the body and that its parts should have equal concern for each other. The Bible describes us as a body. We are the body of Christ. We are the, the, the body of Jesus. And you will notice that the parts of the body are dependent on one another. In fact, they can't actually even survive without one another. You will not see an arm making its way up the street all by itself. It can't survive on its own. It needs the other parts of the body in order for it to live. And in order... And also the parts of the body, they complement one another fully. And our desire, as a result of that, needs to be one to serve, that we are to serve. Because serving was one of the key purposes that we were created for. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 15 says, Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. So let's serve one another any way that we possibly can. And remember that you and I are called to each other. But let's make sure that it's true service. Let's make sure that it's not a self-seeking kind of a service. In his book, Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster um, wrote the following. I've, I've tweaked some of the language slightly to help us Self-serving service comes through human effort. True service comes from a relationship with the divine, with God. Uh, Self-serving service is impressed with the big deal. But true service finds it almost impossible to distinguish the small from the large service. Self-seeking service requires external rewards. True service is content to rest in hiddenness. Self-seeking service is highly concerned about results, but true service is free of the need to calculate such results. Self-serving service picks up and chooses whom to serve, but true service is indiscriminate in its ministry. Self-seeking service is affected by moods or whims, but true service ministers simply and faithfully because there is a need. Self-serving service is a temporary thing, whereas true service is a lifestyle. You see, serving may not be glamorous, but it's necessary. And it's also, it's so necessary. During World War II, Britain needed to increase its production of coal. So Winston Churchill called together the Labour leaders and he talked to them. And part of his 
presentation was to talk about a parade that would happen in Piccadilly Circus at the end of the war. First of all, he said, would come the sailors who had so bravely kept vital sea lanes open. Then would come the soldiers uh, of Dunkirk that um, had come home but then had gone back to defeat Rommel in North Africa and elsewhere in the world. Then would come the pilots who had driven the Luftwaffe from the sky. But last of all, he said, would come a long line of sweat-stained, soot-streaked men in miners' caps. And there might be those, some from the crowd, that would shout out, but where were you during the critical days of our struggle? And a thousand voices would reply, we were deep in the earth with our faces to the coal. I think it's very interesting that those with their faces to the coal, to use that as a metaphorical term, are very often the ones that make things happen and get things done. Those that we rely upon but very rarely do we see. Serving is also good for us. There's a story about a Roman aqueduct in Spain and it was built in 109 AD and for 1800 years it carried cool water to the city and 60 generations of people drank from that water. But then there came another generation that said this is a fantastic monument, this is a fantastic marvel, we need to preserve it for our children as a museum, we must not keep using it lest it be damaged. So they stopped using it. They put in pipes to supply the water other ways. And the aqueduct was given a rest, a respectful rest. The problem is that it then began to deteriorate. The sun beat on the dry mortar and caused it to crumble. The bricks and the stones started then to sag and threatened to fall. You see, ages of service had kept it strong, but a lack of service had brought, made it weak. Jesus said, give, and it will be given to you. He also said, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. So how does the Bible tell us we can serve one another? How does it describe that service? Well, first of all, it is a put in others first. Romans chapter 12 verse 10 says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. I was talking just this week to Gina about an old song. J-O-Y, J-O-Y, she brought it up. It says, J-O-Y, J-O-Y, surely it must mean Jesus first, yourself last, others in between. Very interesting that we talked about that just this week. You might consider it's a little simplistic. I mean, for example, should there be special mention of a place for family? Um, could, do we need to define where putting Jesus first um, doesn't, uh, involves church and where it doesn't? Um, maybe, maybe it needs to be defined a little bit more, but basically I think it hits the nail right on the head. Because a life of service, particularly with this other's heart, a life of service is a life devoted to others and to put in others first. It's birthed in a humility, which as the famous quote says, is not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less, or maybe not at all. And we see this modelled in the life of Jesus, who we are told was in very nature God, but did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. But rather he made himself nothing. He took on the very nature of a servant. There it is. He served. In fact, Jesus said that the Son of Man had not come to serve, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so that's the next part of that Philippians 2, that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death upon a cross. You know, when you think of yourself less, it is much easier to put others first. And it's much easier to make yourself available. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 9 says, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. 
I want you to note there's another one another. We often think, of course, of hospitality as putting on a dinner party or having someone to stay. Actually, I think that our understanding of hospitality is quite pale in comparison to the culture of the Bible, where it was seen as an obligation and an honour, even to the stranger that might turn up in your town. But at the core of hospitality, and this is the thing that we want to grab hold of today, at the core of it, the stuff, if you like, that it's made out of, the stuff that makes it serving is this whole thing of making yourself available. You see, we all have busy lives. We are rightfully protective of our time, but serving will mean giving time. Serving will mean accepting some inconvenience. Serving will be sometimes making a way because we want to make ourselves available. Obviously, sometimes we have to say no. We do not have the capacity to be available all the time. We understand that. The question that we need to ask ourselves, however, is are we willing? Another area by which we can serve is to bear each other's burdens. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfil the law of Christ. To do this we need to make ourselves available. This is about supporting each other, helping one another, walking with one another. And I, I recently read a book uh, written by a pastor of a large church who talked about a time when he was uh, greeting people after church and a cu young couple with a baby came and asked him to pray for them. You see, the baby was seriously ill. Even before the baby had been born, they had been told that she wouldn't live very long. And now they'd been told that she only had about six weeks to live. And they wanted the pastor to pray for them that the baby, that the child would feel her parents' love before she died. So they prayed. And afterwards the pastor said, would you, uh, is there any way that as a church we can serve you? We can help you during this difficult time. And they said, we're already being served. See, we belong to a loving small group from the church. And they support us so well. They ring us up every, a couple of times a day to check that we're all right. They cook food for us. They were there when we received the initial diagnosis. They've been with us the whole time through. They're even helping us to plan the funeral. They talk with us and they cry with us. And at that point, as they were talking, the small group suddenly arrived and kind of stood around them. Oh, we come to church as a group, they said. And then they prayed together again and then left together. And the pastor was left thinking, how would this young couple cope? if they didn't have this family, this church family, if it wasn't for the church, if they weren't there to bear each other's burdens, if they weren't there at this terrible, terrible time, there for them. We're called to bear each other's burdens. And we're called to pray for one another. Prayer isn't the least we can do, we often say all we can do is pray. Prayer, let's understand, is the greatest thing that we can do. Prayer is the most powerful thing that we can do. And when we pray for someone, we are serving them. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 says, Be alert and always keep on praying for all God's people. He put this, Paul put this into practice himself in, one, in Colossians rather, chapter 1. Verse 9, he said, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. And James chapter 5 verse 16 says, pray for each other. There's another each other that you might be healed. You know, all of this comes from a mercy and a compassion. Administer true justice, says Zechariah 7, 9. Show mercy and compassion to one another. There's another one another. 
And this addresses, I think, the question, because an important question, because mercy, of course, is not treating people the way that they deserve you to. And the question is, what do you do when the person that you're going to serve doesn't deserve you to serve them? Well, the simple answer is you serve them anyway. A mother came to Napoleon begging for mercy for her son who was going to be executed. She says, I'm not asking for justice because he deserves his punishment. I plead for mercy. Napoleon replied, but your son does not deserve mercy. And she said, if he deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. Very well said, Napoleon. I will have mercy. And the lad's life was spared. This is all the more important because we are family. All the more true, because we are family. You see, family stick by one another. Family make allowances for one another, or at least they should. Family persevere for one another. I trust that over these weeks we've seen how God, as I've said before, calls us to one another. We've begun to see an unpacking of what it means to live our lives with one another and for one another. As we've come today to our Vision Sunday and we've reminded ourselves earlier in that presentation of the kind of church that we are meant to be, the kind, pardon me, the kind of church that God calls us to be, then I believe it's all the more relevant, all the more for us to take on board, all the more for us to seek God for the strength, the help, and perhaps the understanding of how we can be a body together. Let's finish, I think, in what is an appropriate way, by sharing communion together. As we share communion together, let's make a statement and a declaration of our togetherness, of our commitment to one another, as well as to Jesus. Paul talks about recognising the body of the Lord, and that's not just, you know, talking about recognising Jesus and all that he did for us on the cross. It's also about recognising each other because we are the body of Christ. So let's share communion together. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he blessed it, he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way afterwards, he took the cup. When he blessed it, he said, take, drink. This is my blood, which is shed for you. Let's do it together. Father, as we've shared these, these emblems together, Father God, we have recognised you, not just in yourself, but also in one another. And we pray, Father God, that you would draw us together in unity, in love, in connection, and in service. Father, help us to truly live our lives as your body, so that those watching will see something incredible. You said, by this shall all people know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. I pray that you will give us that love and help us to live in that kind of love. 
May this time of taking communion together bind us and tie us together in a spiritually powerful way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Fantastic. We are going to worship one last time uh, as Steve brings us a song and as we move towards our, uh, our communion time. In fact, we're going to praise because this song's got a bit of pace to it. And we're going to finish on, a, on that with, a, with, with praise and thanksgiving to God for all that he's done for us. And then don't forget that straight after this service, starting almost immediately, but feel free to go grab yourself a cup of tea, a cup of coffee and stuff like that before you join up. But we'll be our AGM on Zoom and you've got had an email that includes the link and all the documents as we said before. So let's worship together, um, praise together as we come to the end of our time. Let's say the grace as we close our time together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.
Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. We'll see uh, you in a moment on Zoom for our uh, AGM. If you're unable to join with us, you have a great day. And, uh, and we trust that we will see you soon. God bless. Take care. Um, remember, God's with you all of the time.